Welcome to Flourish. I'm Diane Planeden, and you're in the right place if you're ready to create an inspired life. And we do so by working on our own personal development. So we can be strong role models for those we love and mentor. We are at the beginning of week nine in Sec 100 from Queen's University. So let's not waste another minute getting started with drive states. Our thoughts and behaviors are strongly influenced by affective experiences known as drive states. These drive states motivate us to fulfill goals that are beneficial to our survival and reproduction. This module provides an overview of key drive states, including information about their neurobiology and their psychological effects. The learning objectives for this chapter is to identify the key properties of drive states, describe biological goals accomplished by drive states, give examples of drive states, Outline the neurobiological basis of drive states such as hunger and arousal, and discuss the main moderators and determinants of drive states such as hunger and arousal. As mentioned before, I am a student, not a teacher. I am simply sharing my journey as I do my research for my new books. So, welcome. You can read along, you can think along, you can listen along, but let's get started. What is the longest you've ever gone without eating? A couple hours, an entire day, how did it feel? Humans rely critically on food for nutrition and energy, and the absence of food can create drastic changes, not only in physical appearance, but in thoughts and behaviors. If you've ever fasted for a day, you probably notice how hunger can take over your mind, directing your attention to foods you could be eating a cheesy slice of pizza, or perhaps some sweet cold ice cream, and motivating you to obtain and consume these foods. And once you have eaten and your hunger has been satisfied, your thoughts and behaviors return to normal. Hunger is a drive state, an effective experience, something you feel like the sensation of being tired or hungry, that motivates organisms to fulfill goals that are generally beneficial to their survival and reproduction. Like other drive states, such as thirst or sexual arousal, hunger has a profound impact on the functioning of the mind. It affects psychological processes, such as perception, attention, emotion, and motivation, and influences the behaviors that these processes generate. Key Properties of Drive States Drive states differ from other affective or emotional states in terms of the biological functions they accomplish. Whereas all affective states possess balance, i.e. they are positive or negative, and serve to motivate approach or avoidance behaviors, drive states are unique in that they generate behaviors that result in specific benefits for the body. For example, hunger directs individuals to eat foods that increase blood sugar levels in the body while thirst causes individuals to drink fluids that increase water levels in the body. Different drive states have different triggers. Most drive states respond to both internal and external cues, but the combination of internal and external cues and the specific types of cues differ between drives. Hunger, for example, depends on internal, visceral signals, as well as sensory signals, such as the sight or smell of tasty food. Different drive states also result in different cognitive and emotional states and are associated with different behaviors. Yet despite these differences, there are a number of properties common to all drive states. Homeostasis. Humans, like all organisms, need to maintain a stable state in their various physiological systems. For example, the excess loss of body water results in dehydration, a dangerous and potentially fatal state. However, too much water can be damaging as well. Thus, a moderate and stable level of body fluid is ideal. The tendency of an organism to maintain this stability across all different physiological systems in the body is called homeostasis. Homeostasis is maintained via two key factors. First, the state of the system being regulated must be monitored and compared to an ideal level or set point. Second, there need to be mechanisms for moving the system back to the set point, that is, to restore homeostasis when deviations from it are detected. To better understand this, think of the thermostat in your own home. It detects when the current temperature in the house is different 
than the temperature you have set it at, i.e. the set point. Once the thermostat recognizes the difference, the heating or air conditioning turns on to bring the overall temperature back to the designated level. Many homeostatic mechanisms such as blood circulation and immune responses are automatic and non-conscious. Others, however, involve deliberate action. Most drive states motivate action to restore homeostasis using both punishments and rewards. Imagine that these homeostatic mechanisms are like molecular parents. When you behave poorly by departing from the set point, such as not eating or being somewhere too cold, they raise their voice at you. You experience this as the bad feelings or punishments of hunger, thirst, or feeling too cold or too hot. However, when you behave well, such as eating nutritious foods when hungry, these homeostatic parents reward you with the pleasure that comes from any activity that moves the system back toward the set point. For example, when body temperature declines below the set point, any activity that helps to restore homeostasis, such as putting one's hand in warm water, feels pleasurable. And likewise, when body temperature rises above the set point, anything that cools it feels pleasurable. The narrowing of attention. As drive states intensify, they direct attention toward elements, activities, and forms of consumption that satisfy the biological need associated with the drive. Hunger, for example, draws attention toward food. Outcomes and objects that are not related to satisfying hunger lose their value. For instance, has anyone ever invited you to do a fun activity while you were hungry? Likely, your response was something like, I'm not doing anything until I eat first. <laughs> Indeed, at a sufficient level of intensity, individuals will sacrifice almost any quantity of goods that do not address the needs signaled by the drive state. For example, cocaine addicts, according to Gawain in 1991, report that virtually all thoughts are focused on cocaine during binges. Nourishment, sleep, money, loved ones, responsibility, and survival lose all significance. Drive states also produce a second form of attention narrowing, a collapsing of time perspective toward the present. That is, they make us impatient. While this form of attention narrowing is particularly pronounced for the outcomes and behaviors directly related to the biological function being served by the drive state at issue, for example, I need food now, it applies to general concerns for the future as well. Caroline Lowenstein in 2006, for example, investigated the impact of sexual arousal on the thoughts and behaviors of a sample of male undergraduates. These undergraduates were lent laptop computers that they took to their private residences where they answered a series of questions, both in the normal states and in states of high sexual arousal. Early and Lowenstein found that being sexually aroused made people extremely impatient for both sexual outcomes and for outcomes in other domains, such as those involving money. In another study, Gordano et al. in 2002 found that heroin addicts were more impatient with respect to heroin when they were craving it than when they were not. More surprisingly, they were also more impatient toward money. They value delayed money less when they were actively craving heroin. Yet a third form of attention narrowing involves thoughts and outcomes related to the self versus others. Intense drive states tend to narrow one's focus inwardly and to undermine altruism or the desire to do good for others. People who are hungry, in pain, or craving drugs tend to be selfish. Indeed, popular interrogation methods involve depriving individuals of sleep, food, or water so as to trigger intense drive states, leading the subject of the interrogation to divulge information that may betray comrades, friends, and family. Current controversy. In 2005, the American Psychological Association issued a report concluding that psychologists could ethically play a role in the interrogation of people captured in Afghanistan and elsewhere. 
In 2014, following critical media publicity documenting the APA's involvement in torture, the APA commissioned a law firm to independently investigate APA involvement in interrogation. The firm's report was damaging to the APA because it suggested that APA leaders colluded with the Department of Defense, CIA, and other government officials not only to aid in interrogation itself, but to provide justification for government guidelines that defined torture, which is banned by international treaties signed by the U.S., in a narrow fashion that excluded, for example, so-called stress positions and sleep deprivation. Critical questions. Do you think that manipulating drive states such as the need for sleep constitutes torture? And number two, how do you think research on drive states should inform the definition of torture and our definition of ethical interrogation techniques? Two illustrative drive states. Thus far, we have considered drive states abstractedly. We have discussed the ways in which they relate to other effective and motivational mechanisms, as well as their main biological purpose and general effects on thought and behavior. Yet, despite serving the same broader goals, different drive states are often remarkably different in terms of their specific properties. To understand some of these specific properties, we will explore two different drive states that play very important roles in determining behavior and in ensuring human survival hunger, and sexual arousal. Let's start with hunger. Hunger is a classic example of a drive state, one that results in thoughts and behaviors related to the consumption of food. Hunger is generally triggered by low glucose levels in the blood, and behaviors resulting from hunger aim to restore homeostasis regarding those glucose levels. Various other internal and external cues can also cause hunger. For example, when fats are broken down in the body for energy, this initiates a chemical cue that the body should search for food. External cues include the time of day, estimated time until the next feeding, (laughs) hunger increases immediately prior to food consumption, and the sight, smell, taste, and even touch of food and food-related stimuli. Note that while hunger is a generic feeling, it has nuances that can provoke the eating of specific foods that correct for nutritional imbalances we may not even be conscious of. For example, a couple who was lost adrift at sea found they inexplicably began to crave the eyes of fish. Only later, after they'd been rescued, did they learn that fish eyes are rich in vitamin C, a very important nutrient that they have been depleted of while lost in the ocean. That's fascinating. The hypothalamus, located in the lower central part of the brain, plays a very important role in eating behavior. It is responsible for synthesizing and secreting various hormones. The lateral hypothalamus is considered largely with hunger and, in fact, lesions example, damage, of the LH can eliminate the desire for eating entirely to the point that animals starve themselves to death unless kept alive by force feeding. Additionally, artificially stimulating the LH, which is the lateral hypothalamus, using electrical currents can generate eating behavior if food is available. Activation of the LH can not only increase the desirability of food, but can also reduce the desirability of non-food-related items. For example, in 2003, a research found that participants who were given a handful of popcorn to trigger hunger not only had higher ratings of food products, but also had lower ratings of non-food products, compared with participants whose appetites were not similarly primed. That is because eating had become more important. Other non-food products lost some of their value. Hunger is only part of the story of when and why we eat. A related process, satiation, refers to the decline of hunger and the eventual termination of eating behavior. Whereas the feeling of hunger gets you to start eating, the feeling of satiation gets you to stop. 
Perhaps surprisingly, hunger and satiation are two distinct processes controlled by different circuits in the brain and triggered by different cues. Distinct from the LH, which plays an important role in hunger, the vetral medial hypothalamus, VMH, plays an important role in satiety. Though lesions of the VMH can cause an animal to overeat to the point of obesity, the relationship between the two is quite complicated. Rats with VMH lesions can also be quite finicky about their food. Other brain areas besides the LH and VMH also play important roles in eating behavior. The sensory cortices, visual, olfactory, and taste, for example, are important in identifying food items. These areas provide informational value, however, not hedonic evaluations. That is, these areas help tell a person what is good or safe to eat, but they don't provide the pleasure or hedonic the sensations that actually eating the food produces. While many sensory functions are roughly stable across different psychological states, other functions, such as the detection of food-related stimuli, are enhanced when the organism is in a hungry drive state. After identifying a food item, the brain also needs to determine its reward value, which affects the organism's motivation to consume the food. The reward value ascribed to a particular item is, not surprisingly, sensitive to the level of hunger experienced by the organism. The hungrier you are, the greater the reward value of the food. Neurons in the areas where reward values are processed, such as orbital frontal cortex, fire more rapidly at the sight or taste of food when the organism is hungry relative to if it is satiated. Sexual arousal. A second drive state, especially critical to reproduction, is sexual arousal. Sexual arousal results in thoughts and behaviors related to sexual activities. As with hunger, it is generated by a large range of internal and external mechanisms that are triggered either after the extended absence of sexual activity or by the immediate presence and possibility of sexual activity or by cues commonly associated with such possibilities. Unlike hunger, however, these mechanisms can differ substantially between males and females, indicating the important evolutionary differences in the biological functions that sexual arousal serves for different sexes. Sexual arousal and pleasure in males, for example, is strongly related to the preoptic area, a region in the anterior hypothalamus or front of the hypothalamus. If the preoptic area is damaged, male sexual behavior is severely impaired. For example, rats that have had prior sexual experiences will seek out sexual partners after their preoptic area is lesioned. However, once having secured a sexual partner, rats with lesioned preoptic areas will show no further inclination to actually initiate sex. For females, though, the preoptic area fulfills different roles, such as functions involved with eating behaviors. Instead, there is a different region of the brain, the ventromedial hypothalamus, the lower central part, that plays a similar role for females as the preoptic area does for males. Neurons in the ventromedial hypothalamus determine the excretion of estradiol, an estrogen hormone that regulates sexual receptivity, or the willingness to accept a sexual partner. In many mammals, these neurons send impulses to the periquiductal gray, which is responsible for defensive behaviors, such as freezing, immobility, running, increases in blood pressure, and other motor responses. Typically, these defensive responses might keep the female rat from interacting with the male one. However, during sexual arousal, these defensive responses are weakened and lordosis behavior, a physical sexual posture that serves as an invitation to mate, is initiated. Thus, while the preoptic area encourages males to engage in sexual activity, the ventral medial hypothalamus fulfills that role for females. 
Other differences between males and females involve overlapping functions of neural modules. These neural modules often provide clues about the biological roles played by sexual arousal and sexual activity in males and females. Areas of the brain that are important for male sexuality overlap to a great extent with areas that are also associated with aggression. In contrast, areas important for female sexuality overlap extensively with those that are also connected to nurturance. One region of the brain that seems to play an important role in sexual pleasure for both males and females is the sexual nucleus, an area that receives reciprocal connections from many other brain regions, including the hypothalamus and the amygdala, a region of the brain primarily involved with emotions. This region shows considerably activity in terms of rhythmic spiking during sexual orgasm. It is also one of the brain regions that rats will most reliably voluntarily self-stimulate. In humans, placing a small amount of acetylcholine into this region or stimulating it electrically has been reported to produce a feeling of imminent orgasm. That was in 1964. They figured that out. Wow. In conclusion, drive states are evolved motivational mechanisms designed to ensure that organisms take self-beneficial actions. In this module, we have reviewed key properties of drive states, such as homeostasis and narrowing of attention. We've also discussed in some detail two important drive states, hunger and sexual arousal, and explored their underlying neurobiology and the ways in which various environmental and biological factors affect their properties. There are many drive states besides hunger and sexual arousal that affect humans on a daily basis. Fear, thirst, exhaustion, exploratory and maternal drives and drug cravings are all drive states that have been studied by researchers. Although these drive states share some of the properties discussed in this module, each also has a unique feature that allows it to effectively fulfill its evolutionary function. One key difference between drive states is the extent to which they are triggered by internal as opposed to external stimuli. Thirst, for example, is induced both by decreased fluid levels and an increased concentration of salt in the body. Fear, on the other hand, is induced by perceived threats in the external environment. Drug cravings are triggered both by internal homeostatic mechanisms and by external visual, olfactory, and contextual clues. Other drive states, such as those pertaining to maternity, are triggered by specific events in the organism's life. Differences such as these make the study of drive states a scientifically interesting and important endeavor. Drive states are rich in their diversity, and many questions involving their neurocognitive underpinnings, environmental determinants, and behavioral effects have yet to be answered. One final thing to consider not discussed in this module relates to the real-world consequences of drive states. Hunger, sexual arousal, and other drive states are all psychological mechanisms that have evolved gradually over millions of years. We share these drive states not only with our human ancestors, but with other animals, such as monkeys, dogs, and rats. It is not surprising, then, that these drive states, at times, lead us to behave in ways that are ill-suited to our modern lives. Consider, for example, the obesity epidemic that is affecting countries around the world. Like other disease of affluence, obesity is a product of drive states that are too easily fulfilled. Homeostatic mechanisms that once worked well when food was scarce now backfire when meals rich in fat and sugar are readily available. Unrestricted sexual arousal can have similarly perverse effects on our well-being. Countless politicians have sacrificed their entire life's work, not to mention their marriages, by indulging in adulterous sexual impulses towards colleagues, staffer, prostitutes, and others over whom they have social or financial power. It is not an overstatement to say that many problems of the 21st century, from school massacres to obesity to drug addiction, are influenced by the mismatch between our drive states 
and our uniquely modern ability to fulfill them at a moment's notice. Well, that was fascinating. I had no idea us humans were so complicated. <laughs> and uh, some things get out of our own control. Like when you're really hungry, you can't think of anything else but food. So I really enjoyed this chapter and learned something new today. Well, if you like the show, share it with somebody you know, and maybe write a review, give us some stars, a thumbs up. It helps other people find the show and to learn about how fascinating us humans really are and how we can, in fact, learn new things to live an inspired life.